Okay, well, this is week number three of our grand August experiment, Reasons to Trust According to Jen. Um, this is the week, this concept is the one that is the hardest for me to map out. Like, I don't have a, a tidy math equation this week. I don't have as many blanks on here because it's just, I don't know, it's just, it was harder for me to mentally feel it out, but it's there. So help, help me out. If you guys have comments, questions, help me out. So like we've been doing, uh, there's an originating struggle of one kind or another. I think I got an answer, at least one that makes me feel good apart. I know there's multiple answers to all of these, but one that hit for me, I got an answer. So we're going to talk about the issue, the answer I got. We'll check and see if I'm right. And then just point out a few beautiful things that that means if I'm right. So um, we already talked about week number one that I would never use the word suck in a Bible class because that's immature. <laughs> but I will tell you that I am a sin and useless cocky know-it-all, and so are you, right? Which is what we talked about the first week. So this is still true. Our Bible class didn't educate us out of that. Sorry to say, we all still suck. And, and week number two, evil is here for now. That is just a true thing. It's okay, God's got it under control somehow. He's going to make it all better at the end somehow. It's going to be beautiful and amazing, but these two things are true. And also, and while we're here dealing with the fact that we suck and evil, we also have real and valid need for peace and purpose. I think these things are true. I think we need them. I think we can see it in the Bible. Um, in Genesis, I think at the very beginning, we're t I mean, even when things were good, before things went bad, we were given work. We were given the garden to tend. We were given purpose. I think work is actually a gift. I think having responsibility, that's a gift. Um, in, Saul, when in Proverbs 31, the wife of good character, it praises her for doing her work well and playing her part well. I think that's purpose. She has, she has purpose. Um, let's see. So I'm not going to read those. I have a lot of text on here. Watch us get through it super quick. And if we do, we can go back and read them. But y'all are familiar with those? Um, you know, name all the things. That's Genesis. I think that's purpose. Work was a gift. Work is not part of the curse. I think it it's been twisted and warped like everything else so that it no longer fulfills like it is intended to. However, I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> let's see. What did I put? Matthew 25, 26 through 30 is that third bu bullet there for purpose. It says, his master replied, you wicked, lazy, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has been given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and thrown and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like, I don't, it's not literally talking about money, obviously. It's a parable. I think it's talking about we have a purpose. We have a job to do here, and we are expected to do it diligently to the best of our abilities. Um, I think we can see that we need peace. One, just I think your insides will tell you that you need peace. You're going to ache for it. But also, that's one of the things that Psalm 23 holds out to us, that God is the God of peace. He makes us lie down by green pastures. Um, Psalm 63, you God are my God, earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you. I think you could, God, peace is where God comes from, so one of the ways we feel that longing is to, why we long for peace. I'm um, in a dry land and part, in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied, as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. 
All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Um, let's see, what else did I pick? Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I do think it's not inappropriate to put peace slash we need has said. That's a word we use around here a lot. God's peace, his fullness, all of the things that come with that. So, all right, also James 3, 13 through 18. What does that say? It says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. So we need purpose and peace in a world where we suck and so does everybody else. Yay! Does that sound like it's going to be easy to achieve? Yeah, did you just nod yes? Alicia's like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> so um, people often explore their need for purpose and peace, like worldly people, all humans, Christians too, but non-Christians alike, we all have this need. We're all going to look for these things. And I think some of the questions that we ask ourselves when we do is like, what am I supposed to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? What is my purpose? What am I good for? What can I count on? Uh, how do I know I can count on it? What is success and how do I relate to it or failure? You know, do I matter and why? If I have purpose, how do I relate to failure slash success in regard to that purpose? Is success ne necessary for mattering? Is it a sign that I matter? Like, you know, prosperity gospel, no matter how much you don't, you know that's not how God works. He, his love for you is not shown by an easy good life. That's just true. And no matter how much we know it, it kind of just sneaks back in there all the time, huh? Because then something bad will happen. You're like, why? Why? And in my opinion, hard things, bad things, evil things here should never be the surprise. Never. Never. I don't know how many times he could tell us, this is going to be hard. <laughs> bad things are, it's actually so bad. This is what Jesus is going to have to do. Things are bad. That should never be the surprise. But I think we can, and it's not necessarily a surprise when good things happen because we know God, but that should be like, oh, that's the exception. That's the exception. Like that's, that's the cheat is that there's good here at all. Not that there's evil. So us humans, we're born, we grow up, we have to find peace and purpose. We ask ourselves some of these questions and the world is happy to give us answers to this question. Some of these answers are like, to what am I supposed to do? It might say, fulfill your dreams, find yourself. Or if you ask, what is my purpose? The world will tell you to succeed, to leave a legacy, to find yourself, to live out your true, insert whatever here, if you ask it, what am I good for? It might say, I don't know, what are you good for? That's not, you say, what can I count on? It's probably gonna tell you nothing. You can't count on nothing. Some, sometimes it'll tell you you can count on yourself, but if you're smart, you'll know that's a lie too. <laughs> How do you know you can count on things? It'll tell you, you can't, not really. I mean, if you feel love or if you're convinced of someone else's feelings enough, maybe you can count on them, but don't, don't try that for long. So uh, when it, the world will tell you the way you relate to success is that you must have it or you are a failure. Um, if you ask, what am I good for? It'll say, I don't know, what are you good for? I already did that one. Um, and it says, it's, it'll, if you ask the world if success is necessary, it will say, yeah, 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 it is. So it pretty much only tells you, you can have peace when you're perfectly and adequately fulfilling your purpose that you have self-defined. Does that sound good? I don't want to deal with that. I've talked about this before. I will have life order envy. As soon as I decide my own purpose and I start like getting it, I'll see someone else's purpose and be like, well, that's a better purpose. 
and then I'll want to do that, and then I'll never get to pick one, and then I'll, and, ah. So, let's see what my blurb says. I said, but this creates the problem of ourselves, our value, our success being the most important thing. The road to feeling that, we have purpose and peace. And this, to me, is why people want power and control. They want it because it is the only path to purpose and peace, because you have to decide your, in your fate. You have to control your surroundings. You have to have the power to succeed. I think this is where the human need for power and control comes from. But power and control in the hands of people who are only looking out for number one will bring pain and devastation to anyone who is not adding to the peace and or purpose of that one with power. And it makes success in our endeavors a necessity to peace. And success is just never a guarantee in life. So what do we do with that? And I think the answer to this is that God does not give power and control. He gives the privilege. I don't know how to spell privilege. Is there a D? Of responsibility. I don't know how to spell that either. So not many eyes. He does not give power and control. He gives the privilege of responsibility. What does that mean? Um, my, and one of my main proofs for this, one of the main things that shows this to me, is the metaphor of sonship that the Lord uses over and over and over again to describe like we are his children, we are all sons. There's a reason for that. Back then, women didn't inherit. Firstborn sons didn't inherit. So we are essentially all firstborn sons. We inherit. Um, and it left. So let's see. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. What am I saying, or what I am saying, is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the el eternal elemental spiritual forces. It doesn't say eternal. It says under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. So you are now you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Uh, Matthew 24, 45 through 51. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant that servant is wicked and says to his mas to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, yeah, I get, so sonship, And being a, a servant to God, a duolos or whatever, servant or slave. It's these beautiful metaphors combined. So when I think of someone just having power, I think like a wizard has power. He just has it. And I think sometimes throughout, this can be super helpful on the macro and the micro scale because we have to deal with a world dealing with a church full of sinners, right? And we're all trying to deal with this. So on the macro level, we need to be the ones saying, you, you're right, the church, capital letters, the church, not necessarily God's church, but the church, not to pick on Catholics, but they're the big the church, have done some things historically that we can all agree were probably a bad idea. Um, God did not just give them power. He did not just give them authority and walk away. He did not just give them control or us. He doesn't now. That's not how it works. We are his children. We have a father we're subject to. It's his kingdom. 
we just get the privilege of responsibility. So of course he empowers us to do things. We do have, we do get his power and he is in control, but these things always belong to him. And we are only ever given the gift of participation that of course he will empower so that we can succeed. Okay, so there's also, I mean, you can see this in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, <clears throat> the, you know, the many good servant parables in there. Um, let's see, I like this one. It says, I didn't write the address on there, but the last one, the last bullet under sonship or responsibility, it says, to this John replied, a person can, can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, this being John the Baptist, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bridge belongs, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friends who attend the bridegroom wait and listen for him and is, are full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God sent speaks the word of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. I thought of another metaphor that I wanted to write down, but it, I lost it. Oh, not necessarily a metaphor, but I've heard Jesus called the upside down savior before. Upside down savior, meaning he's upside down to what the world thinks a conqueror and a savior is going to be. He didn't come to get power. He came to give power. I know that's ironic based on this, but he never just gives power. He gives the privilege of responsibility and he empowers it. He empowers us to do it. Now, there is still evil in the world. So I think it's important for the church and Christians to talk amongst ourselves about this a lot and to the outside world about this because they do need to know our honest metric for deciding within ourselves and ourselves as a body when they should and when we should ascribe something to God or not. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people out there like, I don't, God is horrible, look at, Christians. He was like, well, that's actually, a, that's bad logic. That's not good math. <laughs> that's not the equation you put on the board. That doesn't work. And this is why. This is why. Because you, there is power. He does empower, and people have situational temporary powers here. But if you're just using power, you're not working with the Lord. And what you do while God might redeem it and use it, isn't necessarily going to be a good representation of him. Okay. So, all right. Let's talk about peace and success, I guess, a little bit. It says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and, in and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local council and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will, will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. 
and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So that's where our peace has to come from. It does not come from success. It's the same, it's the same as, yeah, I suck, but I never mattered because of my worth or because of my success or because of what I bring to the table. I matter because he loves me and we can count on him because he knows he knew the end at the beginning because what was the first one because we suck yeah what was the first one? Oh, because he uses his justice not his love to save us and because he does not give power and control he gives the privilege of responsibility so all right luke 10 16 whoever listens to you listens to me whoever rejects you rejects me but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me oh you're fine phone went off <laughs> all right and then so jesus turned and said to peter get behind me satan you are a stumbling block to me you do not have in mind the concerns of god but merely human concerns i think that is an excellent example of uh, I am on my last page, front side, um, second or third, third bullet under peace slash success. Bottom of the page, yeah. So it's, I mean, Peter is actively, like, he's on board. He's on Jesus' team. You know what I mean? But even he gets the goals a little funky sometimes. We're all going to do that. Um. <clears throat> Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. When I give you power, you don't get to choose what to do with it. It's his power and it's his mission. We get the privilege of responsibility. It's like I was talking about at communion last week. Like, <laughs> you got to learn to see the good in responsibilities because they come with not good, right? <laughs> Like the privilege of indoor plumbing comes with cleaning toilets. But would you rather trade it? No, of course not. So cleaning a toilet is the sign of a blessing in your life. And sometimes doing the work that we have to do or we're asked to do is a sign of a blessing in your life, especially the burden of the people you've been given to love. Anytime it's hard, you're right there with Jesus because he did really hard work loving gross people. You know what I'm saying? All right. So, and then the Lord's Prayer, the hallowed be your name. Danny talks about this all the time. That does not mean, well, I hope that everyone really likes your reputation. And that's not what it means. It means I'm, I, I choose to enthusiastically, excitedly take up the privilege of responsibility you have given me and trusting you to empower and control the outcome, the works, the ideas, the situations that I find myself in. So like I said, it works on the macro level because <clears throat> everyone who abuses power, you guys don't have these blinks. Like I said, it took me, it was harder to map this one out in my head on a piece of paper. Some of them go on paper beautifully and some of them are like, get onto the paper. So, but everyone who abuses their, their power they will be held accountable for it. We can count on justice. We can count on that. In this case, the word justice in that case, the word justice is punishment, right? Because there's those two sides of the coin that we talked about that first week. What is justice? What is, what is justice? Justice is, I heard a definition. I need to write it down. Justice is God's uh, unequivocal, oh, what did they say? Uh, preference or choosing of holiness and whatever he has to do to choose that holiness and maintain that standard, not just for himself, but for all of us, because if he lowers the standard, how, what, what hope do we have? Then his seeking after that holiness for us and on behalf of himself is justice. Now, sometimes that involves punishment and destruction. Like it says, like it says, it says those who, who oh, I don't know what, where, where, oh, yeah. Oh, where was that one? Bad things will happen, though, if you don't do what he's told you to do. 
So in this case, that's that justice. And if you're on the other side of that and you are the one doing what he's been told and you're suffering for that, justice for you is that you're not going to be suffering anymore, that that suffering will be paid for. So it's like both. Yeah. Anyway, so everyone who abuses their power will have to account for it. And also this keeps this helps is another way to help keep our self-esteem in check, in check. Because it's a lot like with the first week. It's not his love. I don't have to earn his love that saves me. He loves me already. And because he loves us so much, he put legs on it by making it actually legally just for us to be saved. If we say, whoa, Jesus, that's how I'm getting in. It's, he made it legal. And because of that, I can't be all high in my britches like, ah, you're welcome that I'm here. I'm super good for you. Jesus loves me. And I can't be like, oh, I'm so awful because, yeah, I'm loved, but I didn't do it. And I'm awful, but look how much I'm loved anyway. Same with, it's a lot like this, whether in my earthly endeavors, if I'm experiencing a lot of success, that's not me. That's not my power. It's his power. I just have the privilege of responsibility over that power, over that ministry, over that whatever he's given to me. So I can never be like, I did this. You're welcome that I'm here. You don't actually need Jesus. You just need me. You're welcome. I can't do that. That's unrealistic. I also, though, can't be like, oh, I can't do anything <laughs> because I'm not counting on having my power. I'm counting on being given a responsibility and he's going to empower its completion. So you're hemmed in on either side. Christians are not allowed to hate ourselves and we're not allowed to have big britches. We just, it's illogical. If you're stuck in a I suck rut, it's illogical. I know that doesn't help get you out of it. You're welcome. I've solved all your problems. <laughs> it's like saying you're sad. Well, stop it. You're welcome. All you needed was me to say that. So, but it can, it can be one of the things we use to fight to get out of that. And if you're big on yourself, that can also be hard to get out of. That's usually the problem I have more than being down on myself. I like me. So I usually have to use this one to be like, great. Did you though? Did you? Because if God didn't decide to bless that, it ain't happening. Tim Keller says that the difference between a good sermon and a bad sermon is preparation. But the difference between a good sermon and a great sermon is the Holy Spirit. He can't do it. All he can do is prepare like always. And that's true of all of us in any of our endeavors. Yeah. So does that make sense? Are you with me? I think we can trust God because he does not give power and control. He gives the privilege of responsibility. Because we do live in a world where people suck, so we're going to mess this up. And evil is here. Here's the answer. This is one of the ways we can check. Are we right? Are we on the right path? Do I know it's not my power? Is it my goals or his goals that I'm trying to further? And, and if we know this and the Lord through whatever reason says, hey, change course, that's not that big of an insult. Like there shouldn't be like, oh, okay, it's his, it's his, he's steering the ship. Let him, right? No, that's what I got for this one. Does anybody have... Anything else, another beautiful implication that this may bring or a comment or a place where either servanthood or sonship or anything like that proves or disproves my logical leap? Miss Mona? Come Hold on, let's get you a mic real quick so Karen can hear you. I uh, should be able to grab the black one. It's in the jumble box. Do, 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 do. All right. Put it right on your mouth. Okay. I, 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 it brings the conclusion that God helps those that help themselves. What do you mean? What do I mean? Um, if we help ourselves and not... Don't be shy. Get it right on your mouth. If we, if we help ourselves... Um, to get go get good at what we're doing, he helps us. But I don't know that he helps a lot of people uh, that don't want to help themselves. 
That is complicated. And there's a hundred thousand ways to talk about that. I mean, first of all, yeah, we are never, you're never allowed to just sit there on your laurels if you're following the Lord. I think he's gone. I mean, what are the descriptions that he gives us of what we're meant to do? Pick up our cross, die, right? Serve. These are all verbs. You are not allowed to just sit there. Um, and if we seek him first, all of these things will be added to us. I sort of, that's one of the, one of the things that makes me interested in this concept is humility in the church. Because when someone is awesome at something in the church, I'm really trying hard not to pick on Twyla. If someone is awesome at something, you know what I mean? Like we have this weird, not, not she does, she's just awesome at singing, but she, anybody who's awesome at something in the church, we have this weird conversation whenever somebody says, hey, that's great. You, you know, it's, it's like, do I say thank you? Do I have to toss it to the Lord? Like, what do, how do I handle it? And also, um, I, at Southwest, where I grew up, we had a, we had a choir. Um, and we did a joint event with Western Hills' family singers for a Christmas ages ago. And I remember I had never experienced working with Twyla leading music, but I had with Our Lady. And Our Lady was very elementary school. Like, if you want to, that qualifies you. You just come and you join our choir, and you just, and even if you're horrible, she'd be like, okay, nice try. And that is not how to <laughs> choir. I don't know if you guys knew, but if you're wrong, and you're making the wrong sound, not subjectively, objectively making the wrong sound, she's gonna tell you. And I heard this, and, I, and I, I've always had this issue because I'm super blunt, and that doesn't fit in the church when everybody's being all humble and nice, and it's just, it's hard. So I've always had an issue, like, with, can't we demand people are actually good at singing? No, are we not? Is that anti-Jesus? Like, they'll feel, but we can't hurt their feelings if they want to be in the choir. We can't be like, sweetie, God didn't gift you this way. Please sit down. Let's find out what you are good at. But it ain't this. You know, that's not, that's not how they handled it. And I heard a sermon by Tim Keller, of course, because he's my, I have like my preacher crush. I need to branch out. If you guys listen to anybody, like let me know. Um, but he was, he did a whole, I sent it to Twyla because it, 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 I was like, man, this impacts me about skillfully leading worship, about how the Lord is owed beautiful music. Like he deserves it. He put the talent out here. You know what I mean? Just because you want to serve in a particular way doesn't mean you're meant to. And that it's okay to have standards. And that actually success in serving the Lord, if he's empowering you and if he has gifted you in something, isn't a level of skill and success like a notable one, something we should expect? And if so, how do we deal with that? But also, we can't expect to be good at things all the time. So how do we deal with that? Can you guys pass them? Do you guys still have the mic? Can you hand it to Cheryl? Where did it go? Chance will bring it to you. I'm sorry, but I really disagree with what you just said. Okay, hit me. He didn't say, all you who have gift of a great voice, sing to me. That is it's not what he said. for us to sing in worship to him, and the worship is what pleases him. Yes, so it is. Does it is deserve, what pleases does him. Does he deserve the best music? Yes. No, he yes. deserves the best worship. He does both. Why can't? We're a group. We are a group. So why can't we all worship be well in our hearts to a high standard. You want to get the mic? Well, there's, there's a difference but between the reason that I resigned from the praise team okay. is that I felt my skill wasn't up to having the microphone in my mouth. That does not mean that I don't sing. Right, sing, or that you don't worship. I worship and I sing to the best of my ability but I came to the point where this congregation deserved more than I could give it through a microphone. Yeah, Jen. You turned up your 14. That one's 14. <laughs> so Jen was addressing leadership, not participation. Everybody's worship. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a difference. I mean, let me put it this way. If I was as, as boring as a rock, well, I was going to say a rock, but that's something that Gary would say was really great. Yeah. <laughs> As, as boring as dirt, wait a minute, but then somebody, you know, you, but you know, so if I was just really boring, how long would I be a preacher? 
See, but I love this discussion because you guys feel the tension too between success and humility here in the church. The uh, high priest under the Jewish system that God installed and who has now been replaced by Jesus, our Lord. Mm -hmm. High priest was often one of the worst examples of a human being on the planet. Guess what? Still high priest. Sure, but why? Because of the position, not because of the person. Right. And I think that holds over into our worship. Worship to God with the right heart is beautiful. Always. Does it matter what I sound like? Sure. Now, I understand what you're saying. Should we do our, should we try to be our very best? It's impossible. We're never at our very best, even when we're really good. Because there will be times in the shower when I was better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I do sing best when no one's looking. Exactly. And there's always something. I mean, either I got sinus drainage or whatever. You're never your best. But we kind of know what our best might sound like. Uh, at least I think. Well, see, and that's... But, but well, I, I, I understand. I, I really do understand the idea that God deserves our best. But that's not in Scripture. I, I, I want to I add real quickly. God takes what's given with the proper heart and attitude. Absolutely. It doesn't necessarily have to be our best. Because by definition, at that moment, it is our best. Well, you've switched on me now from group to individual. <laughs> and I am not making that switch. I am talking corporately as a group. Now, individually, we always owe our, I think the world got one thing right. Some of the memes say, it is not about being better than this person, that person, this person. It's about being better than you were yesterday. That's true. That I think is I think we can, that's in the Bible-ish, like not verbatim, but you can pull that richness out. That's in there. The only person you're competing with is the evil in your heart. He's changing you. But when we get together as a group, there, you know what I mean? There are, we, that does not mean, and no group is disqualified from beautiful worship. That is a wonderful fragrance to the Lord. However, as a group, when we're planning that worship, Is there not a place for his giftings? Like Twyla's clearly been gifted in singing music. She, sh she should be up there. It seems like a waste. It seems like, why would we not use that? It doesn't mean the rest of us can't or are not allowed. Some of us, I mean, when I joined the praise team, I was probably just having fun. I like it. And I went up there and I told her, hey, I'm going to try this for a while. And if we come to a point where it's like, sweetheart, thank you. <laughs> But you would serve us better sitting down. That that's okay. That's fine with me. Because, you know, I don't know. But see, it's weird. It's weird. I don't have it all figured out. But I do know the one piece of it that I think I understand is that God doesn't give power and control. He does give the privilege of responsibility. And we have to spend our whole lives working that out by ourselves and together. And I think we haven't always, we haven't got it figured out exactly, us in the church, how to be talented and humble or how to be less talented and confident. We're not good at that either. You know, like we have to work on this one. And, I, and I, that's one of the places to go. I think this works. We need to do this individually in our hearts. We need to do this corporately together amongst ourselves. I think we should have non-Christians that be privy to part of these conversations so that they know you're right. You're going to meet Christians or churches that occasionally are using power and control not under God's umbrella. And there's also the weird dichotomy also. When you're given a gift, if Twyla started singing music that was ingratiating violence, or derogatory to women is God immediately going to stricken her voice and now she cannot use it? N no, that doesn't seem to be how it works either. You know, like that. W so anyways, it's just a weird, it's weird. Being a Christian can be weird sometimes. Thank you for your conversation. Thank you for disagreeing with me. Thank you for poking holes because this is not that simple. This is one piece of a gigantic life we're trying to figure out. And uh, we'll experiment more next week. So thanks, guys.